Hello and welcome to the Newcastle Writers Festival. This is a conversation called How Our Bodies Shape Us. I'm Caroline Baum and today I'm in conversation with Lee Kaufman and Gabrielle Jackson. In Pain and Prejudice, woo, weird looking at that book cover back to front, I'm not sure that works, but anyway, Gabrielle Jackson expands on her own suffering from endometriosis. Um, to give us a shocking insight into the way the medical profession fails women in their right to health for all. In Imperfect, let's try this cover. <laughs> yes, that looks strange too. Lee Kaufman explores issues arising from her surgical scarring that go beneath the surface to interrogate attitudes to vanity, shame, and the way our sense of self is shaped by attitudes to our appearance. Both books are very powerful in addressing the complexities of our physical nature, individually, socially, and systemically. So welcome to you both. Um, I have to say, Gabrielle, starting with you, that as a woman who suffers from fibromyalgia, I really related to a lot of what you said about how long it can take to get a diagnosis for a disease with mixed symptoms and uh, chronic pain. Just give us a bit of a snapshot, if you like, of why you think chronic pain gets such a raw deal from the medical profession. Um, there's, there's an easy answer and a more complicated answer. And the easy answer is that medicine just doesn't understand how chronic pain works. They understand the um, mechanisms of acute pain quite well, and that's pain that you get when you have an injury or after surgery or there's some tissue damage. And all the medicine that we have is geared towards fixing that kind of pain. Now, the more complicated answer is that women make up the bulk of patients with chronic pain. And historically, when there could be no organic no tissue damage found, but pain persisted, doctors just thought that was psychological. They just wrote a lot of people off with that pain as they have psychological, it's all in their head, it's psychosomatic, there's all these terms that keep changing in medicine which basically come back to they're hysterical. And I think, you know, obviously I can't prove this, but I think that part of the reason that we don't understand chronic pain as well as we as compared to other disease states is partly because most of the people who have suffered are women mm -hmm. now there's also a medical explanation in that you know out the way medicine works it's split up into specialties and there's you know someone who looks at your kidneys and someone else who looks at bones and someone else who looks at you know your uterus and the the um chronic pain works through the nervous system and the brain and through multiple body systems and there's no specialty that looks at that so that's another reason okay because one of the things that i wondered is you seem to be um implying and the research and the interviews that you do uh lead me to believe that in a sense women are expected to put up with pain as if it were our lot in our lives from the time that we get periods would, would you say that you think that that is the the overarching kind of idea in the medical profession and maybe also in the general public yeah that Absolutely, I think that's part of it. I think that there is a, a belief that because childbirth is painful and because some women have period pain, that pain is normal for women and it's to be expected and they should just put up with it. But pain is always telling us that something's wrong. It's not normal to have pain that interferes with your daily life, period pain that interferes with your daily life or that stops you from doing things. That's not normal and that should be investigated. Mm. And far from, you know, being able to cope with pain, the science very clearly now says that women have more severe pain for longer periods than men. And that by not doing anything about it, that can actually create more pain. So by telling women that pain is normal, put up with it, we've potentially caused millions of women to live in pain for their whole lives. Lee, I, I want to come to you and ask you, I mean, your book starts with, you know, the sort of superficial 
uh, evidence, if you like, of surgery, drastic surgery that you had when you were quite young in terms of scarring. Um, was there also an element, because you haven't, I don't think, mentioned this in the book, of intense post-operative pain that you've had to sort of get over? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I did write a little bit about this, but I deliberately in Imperfect focus so much on discussing appearance because we often treat the appearance is something we trivialize. Not that pain is not highly, of course, when you have a really severe pain, it overrides everything, but I wanted to focus on a more sort of neglected aspect of um, women's life neglected as in uh, literature as opposed to our uh, life actually how we experience it. Uh, but yes, look, um, I uh, had all my surgeries done uh, and I don't even know how many it was, uh, probably around 15 or maybe more by the age of 11. So there was a lot of pain because I happened to have my surgeries in um, the 1970s, um, actually more sort of early 1980s in the Soviet Union. And in the Soviet Union, the science was really, um, you know, uh, valued. And there was a lot of government money that went into science, whether it's medicine or space science. But it was also into this kind of very theoretical aspects of science. So the kind of uh, aspects that would bring glory to the state. <laughs> uh, you know, like my father, who is a theoretical phys physicist, he had a very good sort of... Um, uh, support from the government but the practical implications of all that science didn't really trickle to the people so in hospitals in the Soviet Union in those time you were very lucky if you had a, a semi-clean um, dressing gown to wear or a towel to use and in fact it was even more uh, rare to find was not not a, a clean towel but a sober uh, healthcare uh, professional, <laughs> so everybody smelled of something there, whether it was, you know, beer or maybe if it was a surgeon, it was champagne. But <laughs> so, so in this sort of um, system with this kind of priorities, it was a pain um, as well as aesthetical considerations, how the spine is going to end up, were really not important. What was important is to survive. The, the surgeon who operated on my heart, I mean, my, my surgeons were all sorts of surgeries, but it all started with um, open heart surgery. And then, um, yeah, <laughs> when I was eight, and the, the surgeon that was supposed to operate on me, my parents actually had to bribe him, and they sold all our family jewelry to bribe him not to operate on me because his nickname was the butcher, mm -hmm. which meant most of his yeah. patients didn't come alive. But he had a brother in Kremlin, so you know, you <laughs> he kept his job. So, um, so I did survive the surgery, so surviving was already a big bonus. But uh, in terms of anesthetics, I mean, there's a lot of stories that I can tell, but just one quick thing that I'll end with in terms of pain was that um, I remember when, so my second lot of surgeries was related not to heart surgery, but uh, I just happened, it's serendipity in my life, you know, I just happened to also be hit by the bus as well as being born with heart defects. So when I was 10, I had a whole series sort of, of surgeries. And I remember, because my, my uh, biggest injury was to my left leg and it was basically, it, my bones were not broken, but the whole, I don't want to sort of make it too gross, but the whole flesh and skin kind of came off. It was like I was burned. And so part of the process was, I, I had multiple surgeries on that leg and in between you had to sort of change dressings. And in the Soviet Union, and it's of mm. course painful in every hospital, but you would imagine when in the Soviet Union, if you don't bribe the nurses, you know, they talk about, free healthcare there, but if you don't bribe the nurses, they won't do anything. And even if you bribe, it wouldn't be very nice. So I just remember that's the last image I'll end up. I remember being sort of having this, um, I forgot what it's called in English, the walking stick, like when you uh, support yourself. Crutches, thank you, yes. So I had <laughs> crutches. And I just remember every time I, I had to do this sort of dressing changes, trying to run away with the crutches, but the crutches wouldn't take me too far. So that's sort of my visual image when I'm thinking about that's pain at that time. That is, that does sound very traumatic. Um, Gabrielle, I want to ask you something that um, uh, is a personal question for me as something that I've experienced, which was, I don't know whether you felt this with endometriosis, but I certainly felt this with fibromyalgia. I felt um, ashamed of my body for letting me down and angry with my body for letting me down. Um, did you ever feel like that about your endometriosis? Did you feel like you had this kind of, um, that you were the host and something had invaded you and you felt cross with it? Yeah, I, um, 
It's funny you say that because they are almost the exact feelings I had. And I've had this pain for a long time and I've had all sorts of pain. I also got run over by a, a train in India. So Lee, you, you got run over by a bus and <laughs> who thought to bring us together? <laughs> but um, it's a lot, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, it does was. Yeah, no, no, actually, I think the injuries, miraculously, <laughs> that I received were much less serious than you. But, but in, in experience different types of pain, you feel differently about your body. So I didn't, I didn't feel like, you know, when I broke my finger playing basketball, that my body had let me down. But after a couple of years ago, after I had my second surgery for endometriosis and also adenomyosis, which is a similar thing in the uterus, I felt, I felt so angry and I felt really, yeah, really betrayed. Mm. By my, and, I, and I felt about all the pain that I'd gone through and having not understood it, I for a long time felt like a really weak person, like I was a flake and couldn't really cope with life and had written myself off as a hypochondriac and then when I realized that it was all real and I, I, I did have these feelings about my body that um, I think that's what really it, it attracted me to the idea of Lee's book I thought about myself in a way that was really different because you know one of the problems with with chronic pain is that you can't see it and a lot of now a lot of young women are like take photos of their laparoscopy scars because that's something that can be seen, these scars that prove in a way that they're sick, that they're in pain. And, and thinking about all this together made me feel really, as I said, really angry and really betrayed. And I felt like my body wasn't, was something separate to me. That's right. Yes, you do sort of, um, you sort of detach from it. But at the same time, I remember going to see a doctor who said to me, oh, well, you know, fibromyalgia is a dustbin diagnosis. You know, we, we're not quite sure what fibromyalgia is. So we just chuck everything into a dustbin that it could be and, and leave it there. And I thought, what an insulting, terribly <laughs> offensive thing to say to me. I'm here in chronic pain and that's the best you can do. Um, so uh, can I just say something about that. I mean, it's, it's really interesting that they admitted that because I spoke to a few doctors, like very caring doctors who actually said to me that they wouldn't write on their patient notes that they had fibromyalgia because they felt that if another doctor got those notes, they would treat them really poorly and just give them lots of opioids and would not address the real symptoms and problems involved with fibromyalgia. And that's, so it's like kind of code between doctors as well as to how patients with these kind of pain conditions that can't be seen get treated. Well, and as you said, again, the code is, in fact, this patient is highly neurotic and, um, you know, oversensitive and needs to kind of, you know, just suck it up, but obviously is a bit of a whinger. Yeah. So, um, okay, Lee, um, I was thinking about this uh, conversation today and, and thinking about the fact that one of my favourite books by Jeanette Winterson is called Written on the Body. And so I was just wondering, um, is that how you see your scar tissue as a kind of, is it a narrative written on your body that for a long time you obviously chose to conceal, but that now in a sense you've kind of um, shared with us through this book? Absolutely. Yes, I do. Uh, but I actually want to answer this um, question a bit sort of in relation to what you and Gabriel discussed now about feeling ashamed or both of you are feeling sort of like minimized by doctors, but your experiences were minimized because I think uh, with us women, and perhaps it happens to men as well, look, I don't know, uh, maybe increasingly, but with, definitely with women, I think a lot of our pain, whether it's physical or the, the one I wrote about, which is emotional, um, can really be easily dismissed and minimized. And um, uh, this sort of makes me think about vanity. And, and I, I am coming in a very roundabout way to answer your question about the, the narrative on the body. So in our culture, we um, tend to think about scars as metaphors mostly. And I've noticed this a lot when I was um, writing the book and researching as well. So people would say to me, so what are you writing about? And I would say, I'm writing about my scars. 
And every second person, if not more, <laughs> would say to me in response, oh, yes, about your emotional scars. And I would say, no, no, <laughs> my real scars, what I've got on my body. And people would say, oh, I, I remember one, one friend in particular who is a very supportive and well-meaning friend normally, but she said to me, it's in a book. <laughs> she said to me, so it's not like I'm just remembering saying this for now, but she knows, but she said to me, oh, your scars, the physical scars, but do you really care about them? I mean, you know, write about the emotions. So for me, of course, my scars are part of my story. We tell the story of the the drunken surgeons and the drunken drivers, you know, like the driver who sort of wrote, wrote, <laughs> um, and wrote me over uh, with the bus driver. And it tells me the story of Russia because if I was operated in, uh, in the West at the same time, my scars would have looked much better than they do. Mm. And they tell a lot, and they tell the stories of my very, uh, my awareness of mortality would begin really early when I was about four because until the age of eight, I wasn't actually sure if I'll stay alive. But, and this is all important, but I think we often tend to, sort of, to dismiss this idea that appearance is important in the lives of women. Funnily enough, as much as we are appearance-focused visual culture, and to me this comes back to what you and Gabriel were discussing um, in terms of minimizing the sort of pain of women. So women at the moment, this is the paradox, this is sort of part of the reasons why I wanted to write Imperfect, because we live in this paradox in this society where women on one hand are expected to look really great. They're supposed to, if we don't sort of uh, put makeup or diet or, you know, we're not doing our best, we're not fulfilling our duty in a way. It's like in, you see this in celebrity magazines that when um, a celebrity appears without makeup, she had an unmade up face, you know, it's, she committed some transgression. On the other hand, though, from, for very, very positive and good reasons, for feminist reasons, we kind of supposed to also love and accept ourselves. And, and the reasons for this sort of idea, they're very beautiful, but they're not realistic because in reality, we, it's very hard to accept yourself and then you walk out on the street and there's all this advertisement of beautiful women or when people, especially people with visible differences who are teased and, and sometimes like even assaulted on the street. And so it's very hard. It's, so we kind of, we, we can never win. On one hand, we're supposed to be beautiful. On the other hand, we're supposed not to care about our appearance. Um, and I think this comes really to this idea of, again, minimizing this pain, so being accused of, of vanity. And I'll just quickly say and I'll, uh, that um, when I was, uh, so in Imperfect, I tell my story, but I also interview people. And when I interviewed um, people with different uh, differences in their appearance, especially women, often they would then after our interviews thank me profusely and send me emails and say really lovely things, how it matched with men to them. And I would sort of feel like I didn't deserve it. I still feel I didn't deserve it. But and it, it occurred to me that the reason they were thanking me so much was not because of something amazing I did. I really haven't done anything. I just met with them and asked them some questions. I, they were actually thanking me because I followed up those it was I said why did, why did it mean to you so much um they thanked me for what I did not do and that was I did not dismiss what they were saying to me I didn't say to them you're beautiful as you are all bodies are good <laughs> bodies don't judge book by the cover <laughs> your beauty is really skin deep because it's not and we know it's not I mean it's a bit like um a woman who I interviewed in uh, in my book who has dwarfism and she said to me look I can say to myself all the time I'm very beautiful and she, she is actually is beautiful to be honest but when she goes out on the street and people do things like throw bottles of her and you know yell abuse you can't really it's not sustainable and I wanted sort of in the book to talk about to open this conversation and say let's not talk about appearance in terms of body image how we feel about it but actually how um, with other people or we as well judge others. So I think it's really relates to this idea of doctors not believing women and sort of dismissing their pain and as well pain about what they look like. Well, um, I think that's one of the things that makes this book so complex. And, you know, you kind of, I found myself sort of shifting in my seat at, at times, feeling uncomfortable, asking myself questions about my attitudes to many of the things that you interrogate. And I'm so glad that in the book you are so bold in tackling the issue of vanity, because I think that vanity is a taboo subject. And at one point, I can't remem remember exactly how you say it, but you say, until we, um, until we admit that it matters, until we admit that our appearance matters, we can't 
um, allow ourselves to care less about it. We have to talk yeah. about how much this stuff matters in order to be able societally to let it go and to be free of this stuff. And I really, I really like that. So I want to come back to ask you a question in a moment about the sort of ambiguities of your feminist take on some of this stuff. But um, just moving into that area with you, Gabrielle, I wanted you to talk a little bit perhaps about um, how you see racism and class issues impacting on women's health, because clearly this is a big topic in your book. Yeah, it's a huge topic. And um, can I just say quickly in response to, to, you know, how we look and how it's treated? I mean, I think even when it comes to pain, so much of how we're treated by society, but that also means doctors, is about how well we're fulfilling the feminine ideal. And the reason that a lot of doctors don't like patients with chronic pain is because that they come to them complaining and they want sympathy. <laughs> and um, that is something that women are supposed to provide to other people. You know, they're not supposed to complain about their lot. They're supposed to look after other people's needs. They're supposed to give sympathy to their children and their husbands and other people in their life. And it's really confronting for a woman to say, I'm in pain and I want to be helped and I deserve better than this. So I think, you know, the themes in our two books are very similar, even though we're talking about something that can be seen and something that can't seen so mm. much can I just, I'm so sorry I didn't mean to I just want to say to Gabriel but also I, I forgot to respond but you were saying about those women who take photos of their um, scars to prove that something is there indeed sort of unwell this is so that resonates with me so greatly because I came across women like this too it's you know when you so I really understand how um how difficult it is again in terms of appearance as well when your appearance does not actually express how what you feel inside the discrepancy between the appearance and the inside mm -hmm. sensations which in fact makes another complete diversion that we won't get to cover in in any depth even if we can touch on it at all uh, one of the other chapters in your book that's so completely mind-boggling is the chapter about body modification and people who deliberately change their appearance and you go into um you know a kind of exploration of what the motive mo what the motivation for that might be and how we um like to try and interpret this as a sort of form of um you know, psychological, um, um, well, a, a, a mental health problem. We, we pathologize that and you offer different perspectives on that. So Gabrielle, can we just go back to race and class? Yes, so uh, the race and class are huge issues in medicine and especially when it comes to women in pain. Um, there's lots and lots of evidence that women of color in going into emergency rooms in pain are, are just written off as drug seekers straight away. Their pain isn't taken seriously. And I um, un unfortunately sat in a really terrible inquest into a young woman called Naomi Williams in um, the New South Wales town of Tumut. And she had had ongoing pain for six months. She'd had nausea that, as a result of the pain and she presented to the hospital numerous times and they had just totally written her off. And the last time she went, she was six months pregnant and they, and she said she was in pain according to her cousin and partner and they gave her two Panadol and sent her home in, in half an hour. And she was dead um, 15 minutes later, uh, 15 hours later. And I really tried to look at how assumptions about about women based on their class and race affected medicine. And there are lots of studies that have been done into this and studies that show even today, medical students believe that black people have thicker skin or their nerve endings don't feel pain in the same way. There's, there's these really kind of weird and ancient assumptions that, that get passed on in the way that medicine works in training and it's the same it's 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 a class issue as well um a lot of poor women will just be they'll just be written off while they're trying to get out of work you know um but and other things like that especially women overweight everything's to do with their weight the, the their symptoms really won't be investigated 
at first because everything will be just put down to weight and and um, in terms of like people who might be transitioning their pain isn't taken seriously because it's the hormone so whenever there's an excuse or a reason that medicine can put in they will do that first rather than investigate but certainly everything that I found was that women of color are just in a really really terrible situation in trying to advocate for themselves they're seen as angry and aggressive and as if that were not shocking enough, one of the things that just staggered me when I was reading your book, I mean, there were so many things that did this to me in your book that were absolute revelations, was the research that shows that um, uh, health surveys often don't recruit women at all for research and that drugs are tested predominantly on men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the things that actually drove me to write the book because I was so shocked by it. Um, it wasn't really until the 1990s that clinical trials started recruiting women and that's because of a women's health movement and basically they were forced to by the American government. And once that changed, you know, it, it started changing around the world. But even now, lots of drugs are only tested on men or even male rodents and even male cell lines. Most of the things we know about medicine come from the study of, you know, the preclinical studies are mostly done on male cell lines and male rats. And, and this, is, this is a really shocking statistic that, that despite 70% of people in chronic pain being women, 80% of the drugs we have now have been tested on men or male rats. I just, I just you know, it's very, very and hard to, believe that that is the case in the 21st century and the really really sad thing about that sorry i'll just add one thing quickly is that now um medical science has started to understand that chronic pain works differently in in male and female brains so by only testing on men we could have thrown out a whole bunch of treatments that may work on women but didn't work on men so the, the National Institutes of Health in America has now made a rule, that's the biggest government funding research organisation, that they will only fund, fund pain studies if they're um, conducted on women or female rats. Women. But that only yeah. happened two years ago. <laughs> God, that is just unbelievable. Um, I'm glad to say that Zoom has lifted the 40 minute time limit on this particular conversation, so we can go on for a little bit longer. Um, Lee, I just thought you might want to pick up on what Gabrielle said there about um, people who were overweight, because mm. you tackle that issue in the book as well, yeah. again, from a very interesting angle in terms of um, the movement. I think, you know, some people would call it the fattest movement. So would you like to say something about that part of the book? Yes, of course. Uh, my mind was ticking as uh, Gabriel was talking, of course. Um, yeah, so one of, so there's a fat discrimination. And I, I, I sort of chose, I mean, language is important. And my terminology in the book is larger people. And the reason I always say larger is because I want to emphasize that um, what we consider to be large and small is so ch is changing constantly. You know, it's so norm related and norm is so unstable. So, um, for uh, so it, one of the big things that came in my research as well is that uh, larger people, especially women, when they go to doctors. Uh, the doctors are very likely to say to them that it's all because they all the aches and all the pains and all this difficult conditions, it's all about to do with weight. And and this sort of culture, I'll also want to talk about this quickly from a personal perspective. So my mother is a larger woman and she has always been. She was born with um, poor metabolism, but I we both sort of grew up in this really uh, entrenched in our cultures. And I won't use it as an excuse, but the, the reality is that until I was in my uh, early 30s, I tended to judge her quite harshly. And that was out of anxiety. So I tended sort of to tell her off for eating this or not eating this or not doing this or not doing that, you know. Whereas I, what didn't occur to me were two things, two very important things. One, my mother was much fitter than me. <laughs> despite her weight she could climb mountains i never even attempted a little hill <laughs> so 
secondly, <laughs> there was nothing she could do about it. Some bodies were just like, that's how they are. That's what they do. And, and actually, thirdly, the, for maybe this is the most important thing. It was not my business to tell her what to eat and what not to eat. And, and it's sort of, I, I mean, but I was doing it out of impotency because I always felt really anxious about her health and everything. But when I kind of started coming to Jones with my feelings about my mother's weight and understanding how uh, unfair I was in, in my insistent suggestions to her what to eat or what not to eat, etc., uh, it just occurred to me that probably what underlined my own um, anxieties was also worry with maybe I have a genetic bomb inside me and you know uh, um, so so I, I really this the, the thing is to you know today I think it's um, it's probably more this uh, difficult to live in a larger body I suspect than even in um, having like a fa facial scarring because people attach um, so many much prejudice to weight. And you know, if, if you're a larger person, then you know, people make assumptions that maybe you're lazy, like, you know, like you don't exercising or whatever. I mean, so it's kind of your fault almost. But interestingly, and which of course sort of, I, I mean, I have a, a whole chapter sort of uh, the, um, arguing with all those sort of prejudices. But it's really interesting with this sort of uh, attitude about feeling guilty or feeling kind of at your fault for your appearance trickled down to me with my scars, even though scars is really not something I could have, uh, you know, I had nothing to do in, in not that again, like thinking now about my mother, there's nothing she can do about her weight really, but it was the same with my with my scars, um, but I all for years and years I felt really guilty. That was partly why I was con uh, concealing them so intensely, uh, not just with clothes, but also with words. I would just not disclose to many people I had scars mm -hmm. because I often felt like it was some kind of sin I committed, like it was my fault for having these scars. And, I, and now I understand now, uh, having sort of lived through this and wrote the, written this book and researched and all this. Um, but I probably, again, I was sort of caught in this cultural imperative that it is a woman's duty, A, to look good, and B, what um, Gabriel was saying before, uh, it is a woman's duty to protect the public also from, from her imperfections. So if I have scar, and it's not just me, it's some other women I interviewed, they were talking about how important it is to them to cover their um, bodies who are different from the norm so not, say not to scare a children or something like this but when you think about children like now I've got my own two little children um, I was so happy that my uh, oldest son it took him four or five years and about four and a half and for the first time ever he said to me mom what happened to your left leg and he I mean he's seen me for such a you know always and it didn't occur to him that my body was actually different until that age because he was so used to me and i really think with this visibility whether it's of like what gabriel is doing writing and talking about her illness or you know or, or in my case the scars i think the visibility is so important because we if we don't if we know if, if we have if we habituated to certain differences we we're less likely to mystify them and sort of write all these mythologies around them. Mm. Just staying for a moment with children, one of the things, one of the good news elements that you mention, Gabrielle, in the book, it's a fantastic um, public health education system uh, or program, I think, rather, an initiative in New Zealand in schools. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because it sounds really progressive and enlightened. Yeah, it's amazing. They've had real success with it there. It's called the Me Program. And they go around and they talk to boys and girls. That's the really important thing. It's not exclusive secret women's business. It, it's, it's the boys and the girls learn about this. And it's about what normal period pain is. It's about menstruation and, and all that kind of thing. And they also talk about endometriosis. But um, as I was saying before, it, with putting up with pain can create more pain. What the people behind it have found is if you diagnose, find endometriosis and treat it early, it can prevent it becoming a really terrible chronic pain illness that carries on throughout your life. And they've had real success with that in identifying and catching endometriosis early because not every person's experience of endo is really different. Mm. So some people can have really terrible um, scarring inside their pelvic region, but not very much pain. And on the other hand, some women can have really terrible pain and fatigue and other symptoms, but not terrible um, internal 
damage. So it's really interesting that even, even there's been stories about boys going home and saying, mum, you know, it's not normal what you're putting up with every month and you should go to the doctor. And it's been so successful that part of the um, Australia's National Action Plan for Endometriosis involves a similar program. And that's actually being trialled in South Australia now with a view to rolling it out around Australia once it's um, finalised. And that's such good news for, for young girls and boys too. It certainly is, and it's another reason, of course, to love New Zealand. Um, Leo, I just want to go back, because we were talking a little bit about politics with uh, Gabrielle, obviously about the issues of discrimination on, on race and class lines. I wanted to talk about the sort of thread that underpins a lot of imperfect, which is your own internal dialogue about your feminism and the tension between your feminism and other ideas that you have, that you explore so candidly and with a lot of courage, I think, in this book. So you have a kind of um, ambivalence around feminist discourse about the body. And one of the things that I thought that you said that was really intriguing was that self-acceptance as a duty is not helpful. And I wanted to ask you what you mean by that and why you think accepting of oneself um, uh, as a sort of public, you know, I, I love the way I am kind of statement, why that, why that is not beneficial. Okay, uh, so just, just, just quickly about feminism, I consider myself very much a feminist, but I, my problem is with the, some, see, feminism, feminism, as you would know, of course, Caroline, is a very broad church, and there's so many ways to be feminist, but unfortunately, in the media, and in some other sort of uh, stages of public discourse, we have often very dominant, one or two dominant kind of um, threads of way of thinking, and that's about it. So, so I think uh, there's many different ways to do feminism. For me, um, I can definitely, in terms of self-acceptance, uh, to, self to accept oneself is wonderful. It's a terrific goal. It's a, nobody can argue against it. It's a bit like to saying, who can, who can, uh, argue against saying that poverty is bad <laughs> and we need to eradicate poverty because we need to eradicate poverty um but because it's a bit like with, with body image because all we hear about when we talk about appearance is body image which is how we feel about our bodies and i think we need to also talk about how we actually make assumptions about other bodies because that that will be more helpful it's the same self-acceptance for me the pressure at the moment is on women and i would say increasingly on men too because men also are now being judged by by higher higher and higher standards uh, especially younger men in terms of appearance but i think um this pressure to, to sort of uh, to say what you accept yourself is really high but can we really fully accept ourselves that's a really interesting question uh, and I'm not just talking about appearance, I'm talking in, in any type of, you know, in, in many different areas of our life. I prefer, for me, I find it more helpful to think about self-acceptance as a verb as opposed to noun. I think it's more realistic. Um, so acceptance is not, I don't see acceptance, self-acceptance as like an object. So, okay, so I worked too hard, I created this object. It's shiny, beautiful, I put it on my shelf and here it sits. I accept myself, I love myself as I am. It, and for me, at least, it doesn't work like this. Uh, what I think it, it's more, it, it's self-acceptance is a work of progress, in progress. It's something that we, unfortunately, always need to sort of work at. And I think some, some psychologists of appearance, when we think about how, how we feel about our appearance, and I think, again, it relates to many other things, I think about it as um, dormant stress now. So when things are better in our life, we, it's easier to accept ourselves and feel good about what we look like. But when things go a bit wrong, maybe we get divorced, divorced maybe, I don't know, or whatever, or lose a job or yeah, coronavirus. Um, yes. So, so when in, in times of stress, this sort of dormant stress can, all, stress can also become more awake. And I think uh, as a culture at the moment, it's, it's almost becoming socially unacceptable to say, no, I don't love my body and accept myself exactly as I am. It's like you, you see, and I think it's, and I think, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's sort of, uh, it, it's like you're not a good enough feminist for women at least. Um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's again, it's blaming the victim and putting pressure on people who actually are more vulnerable. Uh, for years and years, I, I used to feel shame about my scars and grief about my scars. 
And then I used to feel shame about being ashamed of you know, not liking my scars enough. So it was like a double shame. And when I went and interviewed people, and I've done it for a decade, and I interviewed so many people in Australia and, and beyond, th th those feelings that I thought were completely my private feelings, they just kept sort of echoing at me from other interviews. And I thought, oh, well, maybe, hang on, maybe there is a problem here. So I just want to suggest, and I'll to end in this that um but instead of sort of putting I, it's almost like so to say today uh, i accept myself as i am for some people it's real but for others almost like bravado what they feel they have to perform and it's what we were saying before when you were paraphrasing my book very well is that i think the less we put pressure on ourselves to accept ourselves and not love ourselves the more we make space to sort of grief that we very likely to feel uh, not all of us, of course, but many of us do feel. Um, the paradoxically, the more we're likely to actually feel better about ourselves eventually, because you can't just get over something. You need to still have that that space. Which is why you have that beautiful, beautiful um, section of the book, which talks about the wabi sabi lovers, and about the concept of wabi sabi, which is that you learn to appreciate in Japanese culture the uh, chipped bowl, the um, you know the patina of age on something, the fact that perfection is not the goal. You you know, in a way, paradoxically, we think of Japanese aesthetic as very rigorous, and we imagine that it might, in fact, be one where perfection is indeed revered but in fact it turns out that wabi sabi um, is a philosophy of the appreciation of flaws and i love the fact that you you uh, give us that in in the book um gabrielle uh, there was a word there that um i mean we could go on for hours about this but obviously we can't um that that came up that lee just mentioned which was the word stress is there any correlation between stress and endometriosis so there's a definite correlation between stress and pain and we know that people that stress causes more pain oh, and yeah. <laughs> yeah and we also know that um you know pain causes stress so it's a really terrible um you know cycle that people get trapped in but um some studies have also found a quite a big study um on people with fibromyalgia that their stress was reduced and the quality of life was better when they felt they had a trusting relationship with their doctor when their doctor believed them and for patients who felt they weren't being believed or taken seriously their their levels of pain were much higher so th there's a definite correlation between stress and pain and the way we are treated for our pain adds to that stress or can take away from that stress mm -hmm. so it's 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 really important to see like that symbiotic nature because often they'll say oh you're too stressed to take a holiday and then your pain will will go away and it's not that easy because being in pain is incredibly stressful so um it, it's it's a very hard thing to unpick it is and it is and i think one of the things that your book illustrates so well and with such clarity is the way all of these things become a sort of vicious circle, vicious cycle, and also that one of the great problems with diagnosis for pelvic pain in particular and chronic pain is the overlapping conditions which can all kind of converge and make this sort of, you know, I've got this horrible image of a kind of hairball that it's very difficult then to kind of um, separate out into individual uh, problems. We're going to um, have to wrap this up, but I just wanted to ask you before we uh, wrap up completely um, for a little, you know, in this very difficult time that we're all living through at the moment, it would be nice if we could end on a note of hope of some kind. So Lee, I'm going to start with you. In terms of imperfect and the world that you explore in this book, um, in terms of the way we see ourselves and the incredible pressures of um, so the society we live in, in terms of our appearance, um, what's, what's the good news on that front? There's quite a lot of good news actually. So of course I won't talk on and on, but it's very briefly, um, I think we're starting as a society starting to get a bit bored with the perfection and um, I think um, they especially in uh, one of my evidence for this big claim <laughs> uh, if you look at the world of uh, high fashion uh, where designers are like artists really and they're sort of a bit of a visionaries often 
uh, the more and more choose models who are uh, very what I call of course ironically imperfect so deviate from the norm of what they consider to be normal today so you see increasingly very successful um, models with albinism models with uh with missing limbs um and uh etc etc say that word vitiligo vitiligo yeah i don't know how to that's right that's why i hesitated and i thought i'll give this an example or not because i didn't know how to pronounce vit vit vitiligo maybe you know um and, and so so that's one thing so in, in high fashion you definitely see much more diversity um, also, in uh, if you look at if you look at cultural representations, cultural narratives, you know, like uh, TV series, popular fiction, uh, songs, and things like this, increasingly we are starting to see a bit more representation. And I'll give just one example, with which I'll probably end. Uh, I am really, really impressed by Game of Thrones, which uh, also my favorite TV series. <laughs> not because of how they represent the, the diversity but they managed to tell amazingly nuanced narratives of a man with dwarfism a burned survivor and a larger man and the reason i think they're very nuanced is that they imperfections what i call imperfections don't define them but they also don't minimize them so we see the weight with with their bodies put place on they on their lives but we also see that they are much 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 more than that and they're very fully fledged characters so what i'm looking for now and that probably will be my end <laughs> is what i'm looking for i'm looking to such a nuanced portrayal of a woman in the popular yeah. culture that's so that's my wish for after coronavirus <laughs> somebody will take up this that's a great challenge that you're issuing to um, yourself, <laughs> to other writers and to other art forms. So that's a great note on which to end. And what about you, um, Gabrielle, in terms of either chronic pain, pelvic pain, endometriosis, what are you seeing in terms of light on the horizon? It's really interesting that you asked that as the last question because I started writing my book really angry. I was so angry and resentful of the, the 20 years I had been diagnosed and had so little information about what that disease meant. But in the course of writing the book, I met so many doctors and pain researchers and physiotherapists who really, really care about this issue and who are trying their best to get better treatment for women and girls and other people with these chronic pain issues. And I think Australia is a really good place to be because there are a lot of lots of stuff happening in chronic pain in Australia. And since my book has come out, I've been even more excited because I cannot tell you how many doctors have got in touch with me, Do mainly doctors and physiotherapists, and unfortunately they're all women, but um, they are so supportive of this book, so excited that more women are talking about their pain, that more women feel um, ready to, to admit it and to talk about it in, in public. And I feel there's a real groundswell of um, public anger and that's how policy changes that's how we get medicine to change absolutely absolutely look I think that both books in a way your book is described on the cover as a call to arms for women and their bodies but I think that would actually apply to both of these books and there is a sort of sense of momentum and of wanting to take the discussion further in in both of your books so I'm I'm really grateful for that note of optimism from both of you particularly right now when we need it most so um thank you both very much lee kaufman and gabrielle jackson and um uh, i urge and recommend everybody to read these books uh, uh as soon as possible and um thank you both very much and thank you so much for sharing it so beautifully <laughs> thank you for your yeah, question thank you caro it was really